Yeah, we're here at ICAST, the world's largest fishing tackle trade show. Um, so we put this show on. We're the trade association for the sport fishing industry. Yeah, so buy your license. <laughs> buy your license. <laughs> yeah, like a lot of people be like, what's what's the best thing I can do to like support buy conservation? Like buy a license. Yeah. Fin proposed final rule from the National Marine Fisheries Service to create a slow speed zone from Massachusetts down to Central Florida. Uh, shark depredation. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, you know, something that's been around since people have been fishing Forever. in the oceans. Right. The uh, frequency and magnitude of it has increased rapidly in recent years. Uh, Gulf Red Snapper was just getting worse and worse and worse, and uh, what eventually happened, fundamental changes were made to give states better control and authority over managing mm -hmm. Red Snapper fishing off of their, their state. It's been a huge game changer in terms of using state data, better science, more real-time science. People go offshore, you can't avoid Red Snapper. And yet, we're being told they're so scarce you can't fish for them. It's called the Youth Coastal Fishing Program Act. Um, that would create a grant program within NOAA. Uh, it would create a grant program that would help fund projects that take kids uh, fishing. <laughs>
um, if you see a town hall meeting for a policy, like you should 100% attend some of those events. I think that like for the sport, it gives you a better understanding of what's going on in your area. It makes it helps you understand why policies are being made, and um, you, it's kind of cool to see like how policy and government and it all works in real time. And, and then you know, you, you hear so often that, it, that people say like, "Oh, I don't have a voice. The government's not listening." Like. Well, if you don't go to the meetings, then yeah, you don't. That's a way to guarantee that you don't have a voice. <laughs> yeah, no, it's cool that you do that. I appreciate that perspective because, um, yeah, it's easy to sort of get jaded and yeah. like, you know, what could, but, I, you know, I gave a talk this morning at State of the Industry Breakfast, and one of the points I made was if you think about it, fishing is one of the most heavily regulated activities out there. I mean, certainly from a recreation activity that, that 50 some million people do, in terms of you have to have a license. Every fish you pursue, there's seasons, bag limits, size limits, and that's all regulated, especially when you go further offshore where you get federal oh, regulation. Yeah. I mean, it gets it gets really complicated. So this idea, like fishing's viewed as this very like simplistic, you know, just this thing we've all been accustomed to do. It's a, a, a right that we all have. Uh, and yeah, there's simple parts of fishing, but man, it's a very regulated age, uh, activity. And if we collectively and individually aren't participating in that regulation stuff, uh, it's not going to be the way we want it to be. There's plenty of other forces that right. are going to work against it to take those opportunities away, yeah. um, which is not something I expected no. when, I, when I got into this. I just was like, oh, fishing, you just do it, you know? That, but, that has been like the biggest eye-opener for me is, is you know, you want to think like, you know, oh, it's fishing, it's not going anywhere, like, 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 like everything you just said, and then, yeah, you get involved and you're like, oh, there's, there are groups that have a lot of money that do not want us to do what we're doing. And, yeah. And what were the issues you, or issuers you got involved in locally there? So the, the biggest and most recent um, on the Texas coast was um, was around our oyster, our oyster fishery. And essentially, um, there was a proposal to close down a, like a three bay system. And um, it was open to public comment. And the first time it went to our um, to Texas Parks and Wildlife, it actually got to the commission. They actually denied it. And they so sorry, to this do, was a proposal to create oyster to bit? to shut down oyster harvesting oh, in these bays. So in Texas, we can st they they can still harvest oysters with a dredge. Okay. Um, and we get we had the last couple of years we've had extra high water during the oyster harvest season, so the dredge boats can get in on top of oyster reefs that they normally can't and essentially they're destroying the reefs and the reef systems that that are now protected um, are a series of baffle reefs that control how the water moves through there and and then um, also like they're just a giant nursery for all of the fish that you know flounder uh, redfish I mean, you name it that's that's where they're hanging out that's where they're getting you know shelter food everything they need um, and if you look at like the North Texas coast, um, where a lot of to most of the oyster reefs have been dredged where they're non-existent, the water's super dirty. Mm -hmm. There's not as many fish. And if you come down to like where I live in Corpus, and we still have a lot of our oyster reefs, water's super clean, mm -hmm. um, lots of fish. And so yeah, that that was the big issue. Like the latest, the latest issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it just highlights like there's stuff going on everywhere. everywhere. I mean, there's those types of issues. Yeah all across the country i mean you know we tend to work more on like national regional level issues yeah, so but you know every now and then there'll be those types of local issues that are prominent enough but yeah i mean to your earlier point of getting involved like Definitely. if you're looking for a way to get involved there's gonna be something trust yeah. me you don't have to look far there's gonna be something in your backyard so tell me a little bit more about ASA um, and, and what you, I know we've touched on a little bit, but just tell me a little bit more about what you guys do. Yeah, so yeah, we're here at ICAST, the world's largest fishing tackle trade show. Um, so we put this show on, we're the trade association for the sport fishing industry. So all of our members are um, you know, within the business of, of recreational fishing. So mostly manufacturers, uh, you know, traditional, what you think of with fishing rods, reels, line lures, all that stuff. Uh, we've got a lot of what we call allied manufacturers. So apparel, sunglasses, things you use for fishing, but right. they're not inherently fishing products. A uh, fair number of retailers, wholesalers, outdoor media, again, pretty much anyone that has anything to do with fishing. We've got uh, 800, 900 members or so, which I'll tell folks on Capitol Hill that, and they'll be like, really, that's it? I'm like, well, businesses, <laughs> well, there's individuals. We're not like, you know, we're not BASS or CCA. We represent companies, uh, 
that uh, are, are in the fishing world. Most of the folks within those businesses do fish, mm -hmm. but we're not necessarily representing the individual anglers themselves. Right. Uh, so as mentioned, we put on ICAST uh, each year. Um, we do a few other events throughout the year, um, but you know, our board of directors uh, and really across our membership, the two big values they see from ASA are this show and then government affairs. And so I'm the vice president of government affairs at ASA. Uh, we've got a team of folks around the country that work on uh, mostly natural resource issues um, mm -hmm. because if you uh, are in the industry and you want to sell fish and tackle, you, you have to have fish for anglers to pursue and anglers have to have access. So uh, most of what our work is is to make sure that there's a lot of fish and that uh, fishing access is available. Uh, again, representing the industry, we, we do a little bit of tax and trade stuff too, um, especially around uh, there's an excise tax on fishing equipment, which we could get into, uh, not very many people know about, that uh, is a bit of a unique system, and every now and then there's tax issues that come up around that that, that we'll get involved in. What is that called again? Uh, that well, act. That's a really good question because there's like remember. 20 different names for it. Oh. Uh, our members call it FET or federal excise tax because that's the way it looks on the IRS form. Uh, it's uh, the, the funding all goes into something called the Sport Fish uh, Restoration mm -hmm. Program. Sport, uh, that's all the Sport Fish Restoration and Boating Trust Fund. Uh, people will call it Dingle Johnson or Walla yeah, Bro because those are is. who the, the senators, representatives that originally created the, the, the tax back in the 50s and then amended it in the 80s. It, I guess it's a it's a good question because it's something we've haven't talked about. Yeah. Like it's this awesome system, this great right. conservation program, and we've done a horrible job of marketing it and branding it because it doesn't even have a good name and people don't call. And awareness of it is so extremely but low. That's the excise tax, and like you said, it goes into a trust, and that trust is what is used to maintain boat ramps, yep. to uh, establish parks. Yep. Um, and so, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I haven't looked at it in a while, but um, when you buy a fishing license, that money um, gets matched by the trust. So, yeah, the way it works, so, yeah, most all state fish and wildlife agencies are funded almost entirely by license dollars and right. excise tax dollars. And it, it's the same on the hunting side. Uh, there's an excise tax yeah. on firearms and ammunition. Um, and so the state gets their license dollars. Um, they cannot receive excise tax dollars unless they've ensured that their license dollars are entirely right. going to support fisheries and fisheries management. That's always something that was a worry with state legislatures is they're looking for ways to offset funding yep. and, hey, we got this pot of license yep. money, let's use it to build bridges or pay for schools or, or whatever else. So they can do that, but they're not going to get any of these federal excise tax dollars if they do. And then the, the, the excise tax dollars go back to the states through grants mm -hmm. and states have to match 25% of the grants. And as you mentioned, they go towards boat ramps, uh, habitat registration projects, uh, all stuff that you know benefits the industry. In, um there have been projects through that fund in every county in the country, correct? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's been, so since 1950, I forget the number. It's, last I saw it was like $8 billion, $9 billion. I mean, you're talking thousands of projects. It's, yeah. it's touched pretty much every fishery, every county you can think of. There's, there's been money through this program, all funded by sportmen, sportsmen, right. anglers uh, through the industry. Um, that uh, We had a former president that would call it the the greatest conservation story never told. Like, yeah, amazing work being done and hardly anybody knows, about, other than the ones that are paying the tax and the ones that are spending it in the state fish and wildlife agencies. Yeah, so buy your license. Yeah, <laughs> buy your license. <laughs> yeah, like a lot of people be like, what's what's the best thing I can do to like support buy conservation? Like, buy a license. Yeah. Well, buy fishing tackle. That's, that's the excise tax dollars yeah. are going to. So. That's, um, yeah, I mean, if you've, every single person that has ever used any kind of access to water Public, I mean, you know, there's also a lot of public land, parks, anything like you have benefited from this excise tax. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you have this in Texas and Virginia. Uh, I think more states are doing this. So we have a lot of wildlife management areas mm -hmm. that, again, are all paid for by hunters, anglers. And uh, several years ago, the state uh, decided, you know, why are we letting non contributors benefit from this? And so uh, they create a system where if you don't have a fishing license or a hunting license and you want to go visit one of these wildlife management areas, you have to pay separately. Like you, you need to put in because sportsmen are the ones that have been footing the bill to date. I think, um, I'm not sure about Texas, but I know Florida, I think in Florida has something similar where if you're going to be on the WMAs, you have to have a special permit on your hunting license to mm. be, to be, to hunt on them. 
And I don't know if it's also just to access them at all. Okay. Gotcha. But, it, it, but it, I know to it me, varies. it's sort of a, like a signal, like, hey, guys, yeah. look who's the ones that have been putting their money where their mouth is and actually right. paying for all this stuff. And others are benefiting, and when we start passing the hat around, <laughs> uh, they, they start to recoil a little bit. Well, there was a movement for a little while to start putting an excise tax on, like, more outdoor gear to go towards... Did that like? Do you know where what happened? Yeah, with it's that? a it's a really interesting subject, uh, and it's come it comes up every now and then. Congress talks about it, you know, because there's all sorts of, um, you know, th there's a need for more conservation right. dollars. Obviously, hunters and anglers are putting a lot of money towards it, but that's for you know primarily game management the mm -hmm. stuff we care about. But there's a lot of much broader conservation challenges with fish and wildlife, public land management, etc. In order to address those problems, the money's got to come from somewhere. Uh, despite every now and then Congress throwing out a few trillion dollars here and there for <laughs> random causes or exempting certain groups from tax. Anyway, <laughs> when you talk about conservation, suddenly fiscal responsibility becomes a big deal, and all of a sudden we've got to figure out how we're going to pay for this when we've been otherwise spending money willy nilly, but I'm getting off topic. Um, so, yeah, the idea of like backpack taxes, sort yeah. of the offhand of how people refer to it. But um, it hasn't gained a ton of traction. It's talked about. But, I mean, there's some challenges around it. Um, one is, you know, how do you define the types of products that this would apply to? I always think backpack tax is an interesting term to use for it because, to me, it highlights the challenge of what do you define an outdoor product as? Like, I think of backpack. I think of my kids' book yeah, bags going they to bring school. to school. Like, should that be taxed and money goes towards concert? Anyway, whereas with fishing and hunting equipment, it's a little easier to identify the range of products right. that it should apply to. Um, but it's also interesting if you go back and look at the history of how the firearms, ammunition, and the fishing tackle taxes started. They actually, um, well, I'll say this for fishing because I can't remember exactly. The firearms, ammunition tax started first. Right. Um, the fishing tax actually started, the 10% excise tax began to help fund World War II. It was, you know, when the government was looking for ways to pay for the war, yeah. excise taxes went in on all sorts of stuff across the board, fishing equipment being one of the, you know, thousands and thousands of products that got subjected to it. War ended, there was a lot of debate within the industry, within Congress, like, do we want this tax to go on? And if we do, we don't necessarily want it to just go to the general treasury because that doesn't do us any good anymore. So would we rather just get rid of the tax or have it go towards what the wildlife tax is going towards, which is supporting fisheries conservation? So I guess the point is the tax was already there. Yeah. It was a matter of just redirecting it back to fish and wildlife conservation. Whereas the whole backpack tax idea, it would be a new tax. And, you know. No one wants new no taxes. No one wants new tax. <laughs> Even so. if they're going to the right place. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it is talked about, and I'm sure it will be talked about again uh, over time as the conservation needs get greater and greater. But, um, yeah, nothing's ever easy, especially <laughs> especially when you're talking about getting Congress involved in something. Yeah. So what are some of the major policies that, that ASA is working on right now? Yeah, so there's, uh, I'd say of the time I've been working at ASA, the biggest issue we've faced, and you know, there's always something going right. on. There's always dozens of issues going on. Uh, you know, it's interesting with fishing, because I work in D.C., I work with other associations. Like, there's other organizations where they've got, like, this one program that they work on, and that's it, that, like, regulates their entire industry. With fishing, it's species by species, state by state, region by region, federal agency by federal agency. There's just so much going on. Um, so we've got a lot at a different time, but I'd say the biggest issue since I've been working at ASA, which is now almost 14 years, um, there's a proposal in the Atlantic uh, to dealing with right whale um, speed restrictions, Right. which I never would have imagined I'd be dealing with marine mammal uh, <laughs> issues to the extent I am when I went to go work for a sport fishing organization. But um, it is a proposed rule, it's a fi proposed final rule from the National Marine Fisheries Service to create a slow speed zone, which is essentially the entire Atlantic seaboard from Massachusetts down to central Florida. It varies how far off the coast, but it can go up to 100 miles off the coast from November to April, May, depending on what region you're in, uh, for all boats 35 feet and up, which um, when NOAA fish originally put this rule out, they estimated there were a few hundred boats that would be impacted. We've since pointed out, no, it's like tens of thousands of boats that would be impacted. <laughs> Uh, and, and it's all being done to, um, for the, you know, on the surface, very beneficial purpose of protecting the endangered North Atlantic right whale. Because right. there are very rare instances where um, 
where vessels strike right whales. Since 2008, there's been five strikes of a vessel below 65 and, feet. Okay, that's yeah, that's what I was going to say. So it does happen. It's right. extremely rare. We've done the math, and it's like less than a one in a million chance of encountering one. So it's not zero. It's pretty rare. Um, but the problem is, so NOAA Fisheries dropped this rule without any consultation with anybody. There's all sorts of problems with the analysis they did, overestimates of risk. They assumed that all vessels between 35 to 65 feet have a 10 meter draft in the water column. Because what they did was they took the numbers they had for large commercial vessels, like shipping vessels, and just extrapolated it out and said, oh, well, we don't know what they are, so we'll just use the same numbers. So there's just all sorts of insanity like that in this rule. So it's put us in a very awkward position of pushing back, like again, on the surface, we want to protect right whales. We don't want to you know, do anything to harm them. But you can't put out just a rule that has no basis in science and right. expect people to go along with it. So there's the idea that like either we do this rule or we do nothing, like there's got to be better ways to go about protecting right whales. We've been pushing for technology. Let's do real time monitoring. You know, if a whale's in the area, then speed which, restrictions can go in place. Which but, they're already they they're already doing a lot of because there already is a rule on the books for and I don't know the minimum length required, but um, so it's been the last 15 years as a merchant mariner. So I've actually, okay. yep. so right now there is a rule on the books for ships during that time frame where if you're on a merchant ship, you have to slow down to 10 knots. Yep. Um, I don't know what the minimum length is. Yeah, it's 65 foot 65. and up. Yep. Okay. Yep. Which you, you don't have a whole lot of recreational vessels in. No. So it's 65, current regulations are 65 feet and up off of essentially major US ports along the East Coast. Right. Um, and that's been in place since 2008. So yep. the problem is since that time, right whales have continued to decline. There's a variety of causes. There's only like 340 of them left. So just the sheer numbers aren't working in their favor. Right. It's sort of hard to find each other yeah. when there's yeah. that few of you left. There's just a lot working against right whales. So there have been uh, infrequent collisions. But so what NOAA is proposing is reducing it from 65 to 35 feet and geographically expanding it from just off of the ports to the entire Atlantic seaboard, essentially. But they're, but because of that, they're already doing the monitoring. Yeah, so there's and, some of that going on so, now. But, but you're saying they need to step it up and to yeah. another level. Okay. Yeah, yeah, essentially. So there's some of that going on. You know, they've tried tagging right whales. Um, I'm not a marine mammal researcher, so I don't know the validity of all this. They say the right whales are really hard to tag which I'm not denying, but I, you know, we're tagging honeybees. Like surely there's a way in 2023 <laughs> to figure out how to put a tag on a whale, uh, but it doesn't have to just be tags, you know, uh, acoustics, heat sensing, uh, satellites. Yeah. There's a wide array of technology, much of which is being used today. A lot of it's gonna be a matter of scaling it up so that we have a better sense in closer to real time across their range where, where whales are so that, um, you know, it's been funny, environmental groups have used a school uh, school zone analogy for this. Like we, we, we institute speed restrictions around schools to save kids. We're just trying to do that for right whales. Like, yeah, but the way school zones are is like, it's tailored to around where the school is. And at certain times of day when buses are going, like we don't close the entire county down. Right, right. Uh, when when school's in session, we, we tailor it. And we're essentially asking for the same thing. Let's figure out how to tailor this to minimize whale strikes, but the exist the, the proposal is you know this is going to be ten knot speed restrictions whether there's a whale within 100 miles of you or not like for a variety of reasons that's just not not feasible it's not safe for a lot of these smaller vessels you know if seas are rough right. to to be operating that slowly um, so we're hoping that there will be some changes we've been you know submitting a lot of comments implying a lot of political pressure and making sure NOAA realizes the ramifications of this proposal, which would essentially just be a massive closure of a large chunk of the ocean to a large number of vessels. If, if somebody listening wanted to get involved in, say, like, write their congressman, like, what's the easiest way to go about it? Yeah, so there's a website. We've been working with a bunch of other groups. So, you know, it's a fishing issue. It's also inherently a boating issue. So we've right. been working really closely with the boating industry and, and Boat US and uh, a bunch of other organizations. So we've all come together on a website. Uh, it's coastalrecreation.gov. Or okay. dot, sorry, not definitely not dot .gov, gov. <laughs> dot org, coastalrecreation dot org, um, where we've got all sorts of information on the issue. We've got one of those pre pre populated letters you can plug in, contact your member of Congress because um, we've got a few things we're working on uh, legislation 
to uh, essentially get at what what I was saying of let's essentially call a time call a time out here, uh, not allow any changes to existing regulations until we've got technology yeah. to allow for more adaptive dynamic management. And I'll leave a if you're listening, I've got a link down in the description for you guys to check that out. Great. Um, what else? Yeah, so that's a big one. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see, where else do we want to go? Uh, we're down here in Florida, fishing capital of the world. Big issue here and then uh, in other parts of the Gulf, southeast, really uh, up the Atlantic. Uh, if anybody's in Hawaii, apparently it's an issue out there too. Uh, shark depredation. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, you know, something that's been around since people have been fishing Forever. in the oceans. Right. The uh, frequency and magnitude of it has increased rapidly in recent years. There's a variety of reasons why a lot of it's you know, shark abundance, which is a good thing. We want more sharks in the ecosystem. Um, shark conservation's generally been working. There's still you know, some endangered species out there, but uh, by and large, shark populations are, are rebounding, which is a good thing. We also have a lot more boats on the water. Yeah. You get smart animals and you know more of them, you start to get more and more encounters. And um, it's becoming, it's, it's shifting from a, an annoyance to a like a deterrent and people are starting to wonder what's the point of investing in boats and all this gear if all I'm going is losing it to sharks and losing all my fish to sharks. There's also you know fish sustainability concerns where a lot of times you're catching a fish that you would otherwise need to release. Right. Um, and if sharks get into it first, that's contributing to you know mortality of that species. It's probably not good for the sharks to constantly be coming away with mouthfuls of terminal tackle, and uh, you know so it's just generally not a good situation for anybody. Uh, from a management standpoint, it's just a really complicated issue yeah. um, in a variety of ways, including just jurisdictionally. Uh, you know, sharks, there's a lot of species and a lot of jurisdictions, and so it's not any one in entity's problem. You know, Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission has a role, but so does the Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council, so does highly migratory species, and getting them all to come together to figure out, you know, what are we going to start doing to mitigate? You're never, you're never going to solve it. Right, you know, it's right. always going to happen, but how do we sort of turn the temperature down a little bit to where um, anglers feel like they have the knowledge and the tools to potentially adapt? Uh, minimize the interactions, is there technology, is there more research needed to be done? Um, but again, to date, just beyond some talk and some forums and a few projects here and there, there hasn't been the level of uh, uh, attention brought to the issue. Because I mean, really, if you talk to inshore, offshore folks in this part of the world, it's going to be one of the top two or three yeah. issues that they're dealing with. And um, frustration's boiling over. So. There's a bill that was just recently introduced in Congress called, um, it's a mouthful, it's, a, it's, it's an acronym, but it's short for the Shark Act, uh, supporting healthy something or other. Oh. Uh, one of those things. But um, anyway, so it, it would create a task force of federal state fishery managers, shark experts to come together and start um, developing a plan for an education materials, policy recommendations, research that needs to be done to start getting at this issue of, of shark depredation, which, um, Again, it's not going to be an easy one to fix, but to date, just not enough's been been focused on it. Do you have? Do you like? Have, do you guys have any idea of like what mitigation looks like for that, or you're still working on? It? Yeah, um, you know, a, a lot of it's going to come down to angler behavior practices. You know, easiest things pick up and move. Easier said than done at times. Right, if right. if you, you can't get away from them, um, you know, it's interesting. There's a company here somewhere uh, around here. It's called um, Shark Bands, B A N Z. They make a device called a Zeppelin. It originally started for um, divers. It's like a bracelet that they would wear that sends out an electromagnetic pulse mm -hmm. that will repel sharks. They've since turned it into, um, I mean, it looks like just a big sinker that you use. And uh, you, they've got GoPro footage of, you know, you're hooking a fish, bringing it in, shark gets close enough, and that electromagnetic pulse okay. deters them. They turn away and, and, and go off. Um, you know, I don't know that it's 100% Foolproof, but, but it helps. It at least points to you know technology potentially serving a role in yeah. uh, in helping to um, minimize these conflicts. Um, you know, an interesting kind of third rail part of all this is well, can we start reducing shark numbers? That gets really dicey yeah. <laughs> politically and otherwise. I'm not saying there may not be a role for sustainable shark harvest to maybe help um, drive numbers down where shark species are doing really really well but there's a lot of a lot of issues at play with yeah. that i wouldn't look to that as being sort of the silver bullet to to fix all this a lot of it's going to be again research technology angler behavior angler education that type yeah. of thing but that all needs to be done in a coordinated fashion yeah. which is what this bill is trying to do 
Yeah. So that's still very early, early stages. Yeah, it was just introduced uh, a few weeks ago okay. uh, in the House, working on the Senate companion. Congress doesn't usually do anything fast, <laughs> so uh, so we got some time on that one for yeah. sure. Yeah. You want more issues? I got yeah. plenty of issues we can rattle. Yeah, off. we talked about a few, so yeah, I'll do a happier one if that if that works. Let's touch before we get into some happier ones. Um, Red Snapper. Yeah. So. Because, um, like, so so I grew up in South Carolina and grew up offshore fishing South Carolina where, um, like, to tell you that they're ha- like, I don't remember growing up catching a ton of red snapper. Mm-hmm. Like, every now and then we'd get one and it was like, I mean, if we wanted red snapper, we went to the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. Um, but it has gotten now to where off of, um, off Hilton Head where I normally fish, we we'll, we can go out to a reef and have to leave because all we can catch yep. is red snapper. Yep. Um, and I think right now, not living in South Carolina anymore, I'm not as up to date on like the, the seasons. But right now, I think the season in South Carolina is one weekend a year. Two days. Yep. Yep. Two yep. days a year. It's actually and, this upcoming weekend. Yep. I'm yep. actually going home for it. Oh, nice. <laughs> cool. <laughs> I hope the seas are <laughs> calm and favorable. Because right. if it's not, you lose your window. Right, and that's the that's the other kind of like really upsetting part is I think uh, two or three years ago, the one weekend that it was open, the weather was so bad that no one could go offshore, and um, I remember my dad and like he he so my dad runs a marina, and he also does a lot with like Boat US and mm-hmm. um, like boating different boating groups. Um, advocacy groups and they went to the state and they were like hey we lost our weekend due to weather like give us another weekend and the state was like that was your shot mm. um, so yeah like kind of what what what's going on policy wise um, federally with Red sure. Snapper yeah and I guess in the state's defense the state probably would have wanted to but this is right. you know, this is out of their their hands it's all a federal yeah. issue so um yeah, it's a it's a mess. So for years, Gulf of Mexico red snapper was like the you know poster child for all of our problems with federal fisheries management. And there's still challenges with Gulf red snapper. Mm-hmm. But several years ago, the the federal season just kept getting shorter and shorter and shorter. It hit a rock bottom of a three day season, which in the South Atlantic's what a fifty percent increase over what we've been dealing. <laughs> anyway, uh, Gulf red snapper was just getting worse and worse and worse. And uh, what eventually happened? This was uh, two thousand and 18, somewhere in that time frame, um, some fundamental changes were made to give states better control and authority over managing mm-hmm. red snapper fishing off of their their state um, state boundaries. And it's been a huge game changer in terms of using state data, better science, more real time science for what's widely regarded as an incredibly abundant fishery. And so it depends on what state you're in, but it's you know 40 plus days. I think Texas is 100 some days of. Yeah, Gulf red snapper fishing. So South Atlantic has not been fortunate to have that reset button pushed. We keep petering along with this. Um, you know, be lucky to have two days this year. Frankly, the we were hearing signals early on that there might not be any season at all, which it's just this incredibly perplexing. It doesn't make sense because your experience right. we hear all over of people go offshore. You can't avoid red snapper. And yet, we're being told they're so scarce you can't fish for them. And right. the, the stated reasoning you get from NOAA Fisheries is because you're encountering so many of them and you're having to release them because they're out of season, a percentage of them are going to die. And therefore, that percentage of discard mortality is what they call it, is greater than what NOAA thinks the allowable catch limit is. So therefore, you've already sort of eaten your quota up just through discard mortality. And it seems like no one's taken time to step back and think well wait a second just let us keep them. May- yeah <laughs> maybe if we kept them maybe they're maybe the scarcity isn't there and the fact that we're catching so many of them points to your numbers being off right maybe that's the problem but um it's just it, it's a mind-boggling problem and you know i don't something's going to have to change to cause sort of a fundamental reset of what are our management goals for Red Snapper? Because whatever we're targeting, whatever our management targets are right now seem to be way off from what people are actually seeing and experiencing on the water. Right. There's just a disconnect between the science, which is not real life, and the actual real life experience of what people are seeing. And um, yeah, so uh, there's this two-day season coming up. 
now NOAA Fisheries has actually been sued by an environmental group about that two-day season being too much and that them not having the science to support that. So we'll see what happens from that lawsuit, but that could potentially shut down red snapper fishing you know, for the foreseeable future, which I would hate to see happen. But at the same time, that could be a wake-up signal of like, the yeah. idea that you're telling us we can't fish for something that's so abundant we, we can't get away from it is, is ridiculous. And it's, it's just bizarre you know, for fishermen, for conservationists, like if there's truly a resource problem, generally we're the first ones stepping up right. and saying, hey, we need to right. ratchet things back, we need to shut down, you know, change regulations, um, reduce the bag limit, you know, stricter size limits. Uh, but the reality is just not aligning with what we're seeing from management in this yeah. one. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a frustrating one for sure. Definitely. No, and, um, and like, like you said, like everything that I've seen, um, fishermen are the first ones to yep. step up and say something. Um, like we, we just had the limits change on speckled trout in, in Texas. And um, the number of guides, like I went to went to the public meeting, the number of guides that stood up and were like, this needs to change, we yep. need to lower the limit, we, we want the trout back to where they were. Um, and that's again, like if you're listening, go to the public meeting, mm -hmm. speak up, because um, if you don't go, then they're not going to hear your voice and you're not going to be able to get the information, you know, get your voice heard and, and get yep. changes made the yep. way you want them. All right, happy news. <laughs> happy news, yeah. <laughs> that's like, like, that's the biggest, like, oh, it's, I, I absolutely love, like, talking about conservation and, and sharing it with, with my following and, and bringing attention um, as much as I can about different issues to um, everyone. But it, it's definitely one of those like, like we got done with like the big oyster fight, and then all of a sudden it's all right. We got to start working on trout. And it's like, yeah, like because you you don't want to like if you it, yeah, like I don't know how you've done it for would you say <laughs> fifteen years? Yeah, perspective. I guess you just <laughs> try not to let it get you. Well, you have like you know it's frustrating working with state agencies. Imagine working with Congress and all the insanity we have to deal with up there. But. Uh, the, the trick is to keep your expectations low. That's what yeah. I've discovered. Like, if anyone does anything for you, like, oh, wow, that's a surprise. That's cool. I uh, appreciate you actually helping for once because uh, it's, it's tough to come back. But, uh, no, I mean, it's a great industry to work for, something I feel yeah. personally passionate about. And, you know, that, that gives you a lot of drive to try and um, work to make things better. And oh, yeah. the victories come the vic often enough to make you feel like you're, you know, hopefully on the it's right track. It's not just a never-ending uphill battle. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, let's hear about some good news. Yeah, uh, I know it's interesting working on, so like the whole idea of working on policy and legislation, like the reason you're doing this is because there's a problem you're trying to solve, like there's a conflict somewhere. Mm -hmm. So like, it's always gonna be, yeah. there's some negativity <laughs> built in pretty much all of it. I will say one ex exception to that, we've been working on a, a bill that was introduced beginning of, late, uh, of last year, sorry, end of last year and just introduced earlier this year called the Youth Coastal Fishing Program Act um, that would create a grant program within NOAA, uh, the organization, uh, the federal agency <laughs> I've not been speaking very kindly about <laughs> for a while. We're trying to turn things around. Uh, it would create a grant program that would help fund projects that take kids uh, fishing, mm -hmm. um, particularly with priority given to underserved communities, uh, give them sort of a first opportunity out on the water, um, experience in the marine environment, learning about marine science. And it's it's essentially modeled off of, if you look at other federal land management agencies like the Park Service, the Forest Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, they all have dedicated programs to not just manage these resources, but actually draw people to them, get people outside enjoying nature, especially where you know there might otherwise be barriers for people to access these areas. Uh, NOAA Fisheries doesn't have anything like that currently. As we've talked about, it's a very regulatory yeah. heavy agency. They don't often think about the people side of it. So this is an attempt to create within an otherwise um, just very regulatory bureaucratic agency, something that's more, let's connect people to, to the things we're managing and connect them to these marine resources, especially in areas where you know, people might otherwise have a hard harder time doing that. So. Um, yeah, I, you know, of things we're working on, that should be a happier one. Nothing's ever easy. There's still concerns and challenges, yeah. and uh, where's the money going to come from? And you know, we were talking earlier about when and where people decide to be fiscally conservative. But um, anyway, you know, no one's against the idea of we need to be doing more to connect people to the outdoors and, and get more kids involved in fishing, and so we'll hopefully help address that. So that grant program, um, 
just kind of lay it out. Would that be like, like, uh, like, let's say I've got, um, I'm trying to think, let's say CCA and they yep. have a youth program. They could then go to NOAA and say, hey, we like lay out their program. Yep. And NOAA would then, through the grant money, give them more money exactly. to run the program. So, so it would be money eligible through grants to nonprofits, state agencies, uh, academic institutions, schools. Yeah. Um, that's where sort of realm, you know, fishing clubs. Right. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of these types of programs going on. All right. You mentioned CCA. Most of the CCA state chapters do kids some, fishing some, programs right. in addition to all the great habitat work they're doing. So um, essentially just to help scale those types of things up, provide more of those types of opportunities. Um, yeah. So grants to help pay for, you know, the cost of the, the boat rental gear. Whatever. Or, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's amazing. It's if you fantastic. If you talk to a lot of these tournament or these program organizers, like, not a whole lot of money goes a really long way in terms of the number of kids you can take out because you're getting so much, you know, volunteer support, mm -hmm. in-kind contributions, uh, product donations. So, yeah, you know, the grants don't have to be big to make right. a pretty big, meaningful impact in terms of how many kids you can get out in the water for, you know, what can for a lot of these kids be a life-changing experience oh, for yeah. them. No, and, and like there's a couple organizations that, that I know of that, that do stuff with kids. Um, and. And that's always that's always there's always the limiting factor, and and uh, I think there's some organizations that I know of, also that I think if they had access to money would even start programs yeah. to start getting kids out more. So yeah, so that's that's the idea. Is, you know, there's no no lack of, of need for it for yeah. sure. Um, but and, and we see this across other programs is you will oftentimes need just a little bit of that federal seed money to yeah, sort of get things get started. started. Yeah, yeah. That, right. that, help get things off the ground and then from there you'll find other opportunities elsewhere so yeah that's hopefully something uh folks can get on board with and yeah I, I, I've, I've yet to come across a congressional office it's like no we don't want to take kids <laughs> fishing it's uh again the mechanics of how you do it um you know i often talk about uh, i had a pre, uh, vice previous previous vice president of asa who was kind of a mentor of mine uh told me early on when i came to dc that um just remember that our whole system of government was designed not to pass laws. Like, it, it was created to make it really, really right. hard. And, you know, that was on purpose because we don't want laws changing all the all time. And, you know, we, you want some stability. So it's got to be a pretty high bar to make any sort of changes. So even something like we want to create a tiny $2 million grant program to take kids fishing, you know, there's a lot of hurdles you have to jump through to make that happen. But uh, I don't know. Job security, I guess, <laughs> for someone like me that, uh, yeah, these, these problems aren't going away anytime soon. Right. That's for sure. You, what other happy news you got? Oh, that was the only one. That's <laughs> all, no, <laughs> no uh, uh, here's one. It's not policy related, but um, so we work closely with the Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation. Mm -hmm. you know, we talked about the excise tax earlier. Right. Um, so most of that money goes to state fish and wildlife agencies. Um, there's other, you know, boating safety, other programs too, but 2% uh, of that goes to a program dedicated to increasing fishing participation. Okay. And that's all done through the Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation. They get that money for the sole purpose of increasing fishing participation. And so they have a variety of great work, uh, great programs they're doing to, to do that. They've got partnerships with Disney. If you ever... If you have kids like mine that watch Disney Channel, you'll see ads all the time for takemefishing.org. Uh, they, they do a ton of work with state fish and wildlife agencies to get them to focus more on recruitment, retention, reactivation of anglers. Um, but anyway, they came out with uh, new numbers recently um, looking at annual fishing participation. And um, so it's always a one year lag. But for 2022, uh, they found fishing participation was up uh, roughly 2 million or so participants to. 54.7 million fishermen, which is almost the all-time high that we saw in 2020. So we saw a huge peak in 2020, went down a little bit in 2022, starting to rise back up. Um, and so that's some good news that we're yeah. seeing more folks out on the water and uh, more fishermen, more uh, participants into the future, more more folks to keep the sport going. With with more um, people coming into the sport and getting on the water, um, is there any kind of policy that's been talked about in terms of like boater safety and getting more knowledge out so that new people who maybe they've never driven a boat they've not spent a lot of time on the water have have a better understanding of what they're getting themselves into yeah you know who does a great job of that is uh, the qualified yeah. captain <laughs> of, uh, of guilting people into it uh, i don't think that's a definitely not a federally supported program but um yeah no in terms of more i will say again for the sport fish trust fund there's a dedicated portion of that that goes to the coast guard goes to state agencies to do 
boating safety okay. programs. Uh, and so there's a lot of work being done there through that. But I mean, it's a really good point that we're creating fishermen. We got to make sure we've instilled basic yeah. safety and conservation ethics into them. And that's not that's not an easy uh, thing to do. And you know, there's uh, a fair number of irresponsible people out there. And <laughs> certainly not the majority, but you run into them here and there. Uh, so it does need to continue to be a focus of yeah. You know, right. Let's make sure we're. We're not making it too hard and too complicated for people to get introduced into the sport. You know, we don't want to make it too much of a burden where they're like, you know, that, that sounds like a lot of work. But, you know, also need to make sure that conservation stewardship and, and ethic oh, yeah. carries with them, too. If people want to learn more about what ASA is doing, where can they check them out? Yes, I well, appreciate that. So we've got a website, asafishing.org. Okay. Um, and we've got a ton of information. Uh, we're on you know, social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. But particularly if you go to asafishing.org, we've got a, an action center that uh, we call Keep America Fishing. Mm -hmm. And anytime an issue comes up, all the things we've talked about here of um, you know, vessel speed restrictions and shark depredation, and we do a lot of inland stuff too. It's mm -hmm. just uh, <laughs> the, the saltwater stuff tends to occupy more of our time. Uh, it's, it's our way of pushing messages out and, and making it really simple and easy for people if they want to take action. Um, you know, here's, here's legislators you need to contact, here's the letter, here's yeah. meetings that are coming up, that type of thing. So um, we'll, we'll, we're constantly pushing information out about all those, uh, those different fisheries, regulatory things that are going on around the country. Okay. And then um, and you have a podcast as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for anyone that wants to nerd out on, on fisheries <laughs> policy, uh, yeah, it's called the Politics of Fish podcast, available on all the, you know, Apple yeah. and uh, Spotify and everywhere else, um, where we do deep dives on a lot of the stuff, these types of like, things. Like and everything we kind of touched on, you've got a podcast episode where you've gone into the weeds yep. and, and talked. We'll try and like get an it. expert on yeah. who knows the, the ins and outs of all these things, and we'll That's spend nice. 30 or so minutes on a specific issue, kind of nerding out on, <laughs> yeah. on the policy behind it. So if anyone wants to for those rare breed of people that want to learn more about the, the policy stuff uh yeah it's 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 yeah. our attempt to try and get the message out in a more understandable way yeah yeah i mean if, if you're listening to this and any any of the topics that that we've touched on you want to learn some more um i'll go through and i'll leave links down below to, to to those episodes so that they can check them out um and and learn a little bit more because i know we kind of breeze through a lot yeah, we went through a quick. lot yeah <laughs> is there anything anything else I don't think so. I feel like we covered a lot of ground. Um, it's like the fastest <laughs> yeah. like hour of podcasting I think I've ever done. I've, uh, yeah, I've gotten to where I, I do this a lot, so I've got to figure out how to condense <laughs> these things to where they, they come across pretty quickly. But uh, no, no, very excited to get back to iCast and yeah. make the rounds and, you know, have sore feet and uh, shake a lot of hands. But uh, it's, it's really cool being here. I'm glad, glad you can be here, too, to experience yeah. it. No, I appreciate it. Um, I might have to wear tennis shoes tomorrow. Yeah, you definitely want to wear tennis shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever we have new staff, we always warn them about the right <laughs> shoes to wear because, man, the uh, hard floor gets at you oh for a while. Oh, my goodness. All right, guys, um, if you're watching on YouTube, please hit like hit subscribe. Um, and if you are listening on Apple, Spotify, whatever you're listening on, please, you know, five stars would be really nice. I'd appreciate it. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> uh, leave a nice review. Um, and again, there's links down below. You can check out um, Mike's podcast, everything ASA is doing. Um, yeah, thanks for coming on. Yeah, absolutely. Happy, happy to chat. Appreciate, appreciate the conversation. Yeah, definitely. All right, thanks. See you guys. Thanks.